Hello and welcome to That's Not Spit, It's Condensation. I am Ryan Beach, and today I am joined by Peter Bond. Uh, Many of you listening will know who he is, but if you don't, uh, Peter was in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra for 28 years, retiring in 2020, and then retired to New Mexico, where I'm sure there's a lot of trumpet practice and just hanging out and just enjoying life going on. Um, He was telling me before we started, he actually played in New Mexico uh, in the 80s, so he's actually kind of coming back home in a way and catching up with old friends and stuff. And so while he's in retirement, he was willing to give me some of his time to do this episode. And the goal for me for this episode will be to ask uh, Peter the question, you pick up a new piece of music that you've never seen before, what's the first thing that you do? And my goal will just continually be asking questions that help me understand how he goes about solving problems, how he identifies problems, what solutions he might use for certain problems, so that we can all walk away with an understanding of how Peter would di- diagnose things and practice so we can try out his systems. So uh, before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me some of your time. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to talk to you. All right, then so, let's get started. You pick up a new piece of music that you've never seen before. What is the first thing that you would do? Um, it might depend on what kind of music it is. Is it a, a, a piece? Is it a solo work? Is it a piece for the ensemble? If it's a if it's a solo work or an etude, I'll, I'll you know I'll do what you know anyone's middle school band director has told them to do, which is you scope out the whole thing, you know, look for, look for the roadmap, uh, you know, check the key signature, time signature, and look for changes within the piece. Um, you know, time signature changes, key changes, um, anything that might possibly uh, be a problem. You just, you know, scan it, look for lots of accidentals. Or um, for more, ex- uh, more involved music, uh, look and see if there are any... Uh, um, extended techniques you know a, a contemporary work shall have all kinds of you know extended things and if it's something really weird usually there'll be a explanation at the bottom um for conventional music i mean if i if i really wanted to uh be able to perform it as accurately as possible as quickly as possible i would sing through the thing just the rhythms and how, then maybe, okay, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah, how yeah. accurate are you trying to be with pitches? I feel like for a lot of people, their singing voice and their ear training may feel like a barrier to using this technique. Yeah, um, uh, I might I might just do a single syllable and stay on one pitch. Um, uh, Robert Shaw used to do this with his with his chorale. I, I played in Atlanta, was able to uh, see him rehearse his uh, uh, his uh, volunteer, amazing volunteer. Uh, uh, chorus for the orchestra and and they would go through it and just you know do the uh i've got a piece of music here <laughs> this is all 16th notes but i might do it all on uh, uh one d da da d da ba da 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 and then add in the syllables later and uh some of us are are stronger in some ways than others most people in my experience most trumpet players little stronger in the rhythmic area than they would be sight singing the intervals. And so uh, I might go through it that way. And then I'll, I'll slow way the heck down and, um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sight sing it and just maybe just go for the intervals and not even worry too much about the rhythm. Um, I was particularly weak in sight singing. Um, uh, Growing up, it was not a, I grew up in drum and bugle corps where you pretty much learned by rote. You know, sure, they, sure. I didn't have, so, um, that was always a weak spot in my playing. And so, uh, even as uh, recently as 10, 20 years ago, I would take a, I would take like one of Jim, uh, Stephenson's etude books to the gym with me. And while I was on the treadmill, I would, I would sing, <laughs> you know, I would just sing the intervals. Uh, I'm not sure he'd be too flattered with, <laughs> with, my, <laughs> with that, you know, my using his materials. Thought. But they're terrific. They're well, I, yeah. I kept my voice down, and they were, of course, playing, you know, <laughs> God knows what on the on the PA. But um, uh, and I, I got better and uh, I got better and better at it. Um, so uh, I guess the 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 
the takeaway is anything difficult, break it, do- break it down into easier parts that you can digest. I mean, playing the trumpet is difficult enough, and then we're going to try to we're going to try to uh, read music uh, at the same time, sight reading literally, and it's a bunch of different skills. Uh, theoretically, uh, a professional will have you know all those skills at hand. I suppose the uh, the ultimate in that is the studio musician, you know, who has to come in and in, you know on the first or second pass, you've got to have it because time is money. Uh, and I always considered those guys the apex. Of, of, uh, of those skills, uh, whereas orchestra players aren't looking at new music too often, and they they usually get it pretty far, you know, in advance. Yeah, uh, but well, um, we sort of you know, say, person, play the same things yeah. regularly, so there's like a level of well, I've done, I've worked on this previously, and so I'm not really starting from scratch, even if I haven't played it in a while either. Right, or it's a, or it's a it's a newly discovered piece by Tchaikovsky or something you've you know some ignored piece it's still tchaikovsky and it's made up of that 19th century language you know so not too much there but if it's a piece by thomas adas or one of these contemporary guys you know that can be some really wacko stuff you know yeah and and so you want to take it apart and and make it as as simple as possible anything difficult can be made simple and tackle it in pieces you know and then and then glue it back together so if I were to right now generalize a little bit of what you've said, I, I I hope this is okay. Like a first step for you on something difficult might be to just focus on the rhythm, just trying to be able to sing through just the rhythm. And then yeah. once you feel like you have the rhythm, it's almost as if you're, you're saying, okay, I'm going to put that component to the side. And now I'm going to focus next on slowly trying to get the intervals as accurately in tune as possible almost separate from the rhythm. You're not worried about that. You're worried about the intervals. Is that, do I have that correct so far? Yeah. I, I, I think we play to our, uh, play to your strengths or, or maybe the opposite practice your weaknesses. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, maybe, uh, I, if I'm not very secure in my sight singing or if the pieces got really unusual or nasty, um, uh, uh, you know, octave displacements and, and weird intervals, I'll put the rhythm to the side. But if it, if it's conventional, um, if it's a conventional composition, you know, Herbert Clark or, you know, late 19th yeah. century, early 20th century, you know, that, uh, that prob you could probably, uh, you know, deal with both of them at the same time. And I just take it in little pieces, you know, you can see yeah. phrases, you might do a phrase, look for sequences, you know, things that make you look for things that are repeated that makes your life easier. Um, uh, so again, it depends on, uh, depends on the music. If it's new composition with a lot of crazy challenges, I might do it, um, uh, uh, very, very differently than I would, you know, 19th century music. Yeah. And of course, what I'm aiming to do here is somewhat impossible. I recognize that I'm trying to create a system. I'm trying to pull a system out that you would say, do this, but even what you've just said that it would depend on the piece and so maybe some of these rules are like in an optimal situation where it's the most difficult thing, I would do these steps. But like you said, more conventional material or material you, you have already worked on previously, you might be able to jump up the chain a little bit because you won't have to do some of those really nitty gritty things on things that you're more familiar with. Right. I, I think a, a, in a, a way, a, the way a lot of us did or uh, young people uh, do high school, college uh, students do it. They'll put up a piece of music, whatever it is. It's a, something for their ensemble, and they'll start playing it, immediately making mistakes, going back and correct. You know, and and, and oh, that was wrong. Okay, I gotta go back and do this. And the whole thing is 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 like this festival of errors. You know, <laughs> instead of you know learning it, uh, going slow and learning it properly. Um, and uh, we get a little impatient, especially if it's maybe maybe it's an exciting piece that you've heard. I've always heard that I've always wanted to play this concerto. I've heard it many times and you put it up and you just you take it at, you know, you take it at the printed, you know, terminal velocity, you know, which, of <laughs> course, is, you know, which is a ridiculous way. And, and uh, impatience is kind of the um, enemy of the ambitious uh, musician, you know, so we have to sometimes we have to, you know, kind of discipline ourselves if you want to, you know, um, you want to develop, build a habit of uh, 
playing it correctly, the correct intervals, the correct fingerings, the correct rhythms, and that involves simplifying it, slowing it down, making the, you know, and maybe it'll be octave displacement if it's a particularly high uh, uh, work, you know, uh, things like that. But you want to you want to make a habit out of practicing or repeating uh, the correct sequences as opposed to correcting, playing it nine times incorrectly, then getting it right and say, woohoo, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. You so, um, okay. There's a, there's a, another component here. It sounds like it's not another component, but I think what you're saying ties into this idea that it sounds like what you're saying is the goal at the beginning is to just make sure that you're understanding it, that <laughs> instead of trying to dive in and just see what happens, your goal at the very beginning is I want to understand the rhythm. I want to understand the intervals. Are there other components to whatever this musical thing may be, regardless of the genre that you would be concerned with understanding before you really start trying to put the whole thing together? What other skills maybe would you be looking to understand if that's a way to say it? Okay, well, if you understand what the style is, mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, let's, um, I, I'm mixing uh, uh, idioms here, but let's say it's, let's say it's a big band chart, you know, and it's, and it's in a, it's in a jazz style and you'll see uh, that kind of music has a limited, um, usually a limited number of rhythmic motifs and you learn how they go. See that deep ba ba do da ba da do ba ba da do da. You know, whereas you know, if all you've ever done is the Arbin's book, that can be very mystifying. You know, but it's it's a bunch of uh, it's a bunch of gestures, and so and they come out of a certain idiom. So you might look for those things and sing through it. Um, uh, uh, whereas uh, you know, some some uh, a, a modern work uh, of uh, Webern or something. Yeah, it's not modern anymore. But anyway, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's actually pretty old. Uh, but um, uh, uh, whereas orchestral music or, or something that's a little bit more academically inclined is going to be a little bit more mathematical, sure, and and less uh, less stylistically. Um, uh, you will not have to be as stylistically aware. It's going to be a little bit more clinical. Yeah. Uh, so again, it depends on the era. You know, if you early twentieth uh, century music, a lot of the stuff is based on dance rhythms, and you go, "Oh man, this thing sounds like a tango." Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then that gives you do that, da da ba do da da da. You know, and you yeah. you kind of look and you know the composer's nationality might give you a hint, but or whatever. So, oh, this is all dance stuff. It's a you know, it's a you know. It's a polonaise, it's a waltz, it's a tango. And again, those were models, you know, for a lot of late 19th century, early 20th century uh, solo pieces, etudes, et cetera. And that can give you a way of, of making it makes. I, I try to say, um, figure out, A, what's the composer after? And B, how can this music make sense? How can I make this make sense to the audience? Yeah, when I studied with Barbara Butler, she would often tell us that for those of you that don't, don't know barbara butler taught at northwestern now teaches at rice with charlie guyer they're amazing um barbara would talk about what you're thinking about is what the audience is thinking about and she would try to share it in the context of if you're playing petrushka and you're only worried about getting all the right notes the second you miss a note it's a really big deal because that's all you're thinking about but if you're thinking about the music the music continues on Pat, whatever phrase you're trying to spin or whatever, the music continues past the missed note, so the audience cares about it less. And I think at the root of being able to do what you've just said uh, and related to what Barbara said is, is truly understanding. And I don't think I really understood, no pun intended, how important it is to understand what's going on. I just thought it was a process of osmosis for a long time. You just do it and it magically happens. But I think what you're talking about with errors is something that really is an inefficiency that isn't addressed as often as it should be, I think. Yeah. And and uh, and as my old colleague Pandolfi uh, used to say, you can get you can you can get every note in the piece and still miss every note. Mm, yeah. You can miss the entire point of the exercise of, of the thing. And I call those players note machines. Yeah. And uh, and. And unfortunately, our our business is full of them, and uh, uh, I think you, this uh, uh, CD like perfection that that has been cultivated, uh, you know, where it has to be note perfect, and we kind of 
we kind of uh, ignore what's what's going on, whether it's an emotional thing or whether it's a um, if you're playing for dance, you know, it's, it's all music that's supposed to enhance or encourage movement. Even a march is, you know, it has a style to it and it's supposed to, you know, enhance movement or encourage movement or make the make the marching easier, you know, um, or, yeah. you know, you're playing the nutcracker, you know, and, you know, that that music's supposed to be a springboard for the dancers, you know, and uh, and you can you can stylize it to make their job easier and make it more fun to listen to. I'm sorry, I'm kind of no, this took is a perfect. Left hand turn there. No, you know? I and I understand to some degree that some of this conversation may seem like basic or like I'm 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 we're not we're talking about things that seem readily understood. I just want to make sure I get your take on sort of the full spectrum because I think. I just don't want to, I don't want anything to be missed so that I say that because the next question I have is how do you go about developing a better ear in terms of style? Because even like even what you sang, it's clear that you have an image in your head of what you think it should sound like, as opposed to someone who's only played Arbin. That's going to be harder for them to do. So the most obvious answer to me is listening to recordings, but I'm curious like how you would incorporate that, how you think about listening to digest and to sort of begin to understand what these styles are versus I'm just passively listening to a, to a recording. I feel like there's two different things there and I'm interested in your take on how you actively listen to learn these styles. Well, I, I let's take a, let's take a, I, th I, I think, I think you can listen passively and enjoy it and, and absorb some of the stuff without making it into a, a dry uh, and, and perhaps a taxing study, you know, so, for instance, uh, when I was a kid, uh, uh, my father having a hi-fi system was all the rage. And, and, you know, so he bought this hi-fi. And then I think at a garage sale, he bought this entire collection of classical music. I mean, it's about 300 albums, you know, of all kinds of stuff. And uh, I, when I was doing my homework, I would just put on these records and, and I would I would choose it based on the cover art. Oh, that looks pretty cool. You know, <laughs> That's how I choose wine, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> precisely. <laughs> you know, and so I didn't know what I was doing. And I'd listen to this and and I gravitated towards the Beethoven symphonies. I really loved the Beethoven symphonies. And I listened to them over and over again. And um and I just kind of let it wash over me. And I think I without studying necessarily, I did absorb a lot of that. Yeah, that kind of thing. But uh, in a more specific sense, um, when I first discovered Mahler, you know, you, it's, it's just such amazing. Uh, this was in college. It's amazing music. And and he's got, you know, there's klezmer music in here and there's Lendlers and dances and it's all kinds of, you know, crazy stuff. And, um, and I just found myself enjoying it um, and en enjoying the, the, the kaleidoscope, the musical kaleidoscope. And um, and then you come across a piece of music and, you know, and, and it has a certain feel to it. And you, the wider you're listening, the more you can say, oh, this is like that thing in that, let's say, Mahler Symphony or the or this this waltz that in this uh, this uh, on this Johann Strauss album that I used to listen to. And you. you I don't think you have to study as rigorous study is great, mm -hmm. but I think you can also study and enjoy it. Sure. You know, and why do I like this? La da da di do, ba da da di, la da da di, ba da da. You know, these things that have a certain lilt to them, and uh, and then when you hear a player who only plays the notes, so it's rhythmically correct, but it's stylistically wrong. Yeah. Right. And uh, that was the thing at the opera. Uh, Levine was very big on characterization, uh, making it making it sound in character, in style. You know. Uh, well, those were some of some of his words. You know, don't just play the notes; make make the thing you know come alive. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying what you just said, and I want to make sure I heard it correctly. A lot of your like Beethoven knowledge came from listening to these records when you were younger. So. What that makes me think is it's sort of this general sort of process of osmosis over time. Even you saying like rigorous study is good, but you could enjoy it. Do you, 
I, that makes me almost think that like rigorous study is like the idea is that like I'm going to sit down and I'm going to figure this out and then I'll know how to do it versus what you're talking about is that you're just gradually listening and digesting over time and it sort of just becomes a part of you after you live with it much like a language I assume that's very very likened to what we're talking about would you say would you agree with that that it's sort of maybe not better but more effective that just you're seeing it as a thing over time. I'm just going to have a relationship versus I need to figure this out. Yeah. Cause if I need to figure this out, makes it sound like hard work mm -hmm. and I'm a lazy guy, you know? <laughs> uh, so uh, it's like, you know, you listen to this, uh, you find a composer you really, uh, or a piece you really like. I like the, you hear the Vivaldi four seasons. Oh, this is really awesome. I love this. I'm going to listen to more Vivaldi. Here's this Scarlatti guy who lives at the same time. And you can let your, enthusiasm and sense of uh, uh, wonder and discovery lead you. And that's so much more pleasant than, than turning it into, um, you know, uh, make it, making it rigorous, you know, study. And I like Beethoven and, and boy, here's this Mendelssohn thing. That's kind of similar. Here's this wacko dude, Berlioz, man, this is fabulous. And, you know, you can, um, and you can stay enthusiastic and involved and interested and, and, um, it can be energizing, sure. you know? And so when you play an, you know, you play an extra, Oh, this is that thing from that crazy Berlioz piece, the March to the scaffold, you know? And, uh, or if you've listened to, you know, Haydn and Beethoven, and then you, then you, some, the, your teacher throws up the Haydn trumpet concerto and you know, it was written in that era. So you have a pretty good idea. Here's how they, you know, here's how they expected these eighth notes to be, you know, because it's, you know, um, uh, because it's of that style. And you might listen to other pieces by Haydn, other solo things, this cello concerto, uh, uh, you know, late symphonies. And there was, there was, a, there's a, a language and a style to that era. And that can help inform, you know, uh, you know, inform our interpretation of pieces from different eras, yeah. you know. All right, so I have a bit of a devil's advocate question. Yeah, sure. What if you're playing something you don't like? What if it's like, or maybe uh, it's something that's not in this masterwork thing. Maybe, you know, a piece like the Kennan Sonata comes to mind. I actually like that piece fine, but it doesn't necessarily fit in this masterworks like Brahms, Beethoven, these things that are inspiring, but you still want to bring as much musical sense. So it could feel like the study might be a little bit more rigorous, if you're not as connected to it, or do you have any ideas on how to make that more enjoyable if you're doing a piece you don't like? Okay, this, yeah, this reminds me of something I tell students all the time. Um, working at the opera, I played a lot of music I did not like. Yeah. All right. Uh, Bel Canto opera is just like the most boring you know, stuff in the pit <laughs> you can imagine. You know, even those fireworks going on on stage, the, you know, the orchestra parts are just, it's like listening to paint dry. Okay. <laughs> and so what I, the game I used, I used to make a game out of it. Um, first of all, uh, one of the things I would go, I would say to myself was I would trans, I would try to transport myself back in time, man. So this is pretty, pretty much a drag, but what must this have been like in 1820 or 1817 where Rossini wrote this or, or whatever. And I, I would try to capture that, you know, and say, you know, can I, uh, can I uh, enhance it? Can I uh, put some something on this to help enhance, even though I'm just going, you know, yeah, or something yeah. like that to underline maybe the harmonic activity or what the singer is, is doing on stage. Um, you know, I, I would try to stay interested, you know, in that way. I do the time travel thing or um, when a, for a student, when they have to play a piece that they don't like, and we all have to, we all play pieces we're not particularly fond of. Um, we're in show business. You have to get a, or sales. You have to get up there and sell that piece, you know, like it's the greatest thing ever. And that's your job, you know? And uh, so you're going to look for things maybe that make it interesting. And, uh, Hey, listen to me play the perfect fourth, you know, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous, but you know, uh, you know, it, it, students are facing this all the time. You know, they, uh, you know, they have this, this etude book and they, 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 they play these things that they just really hate. You know, they're, they, it has no bearing on the music they listen to on the radio or at home. And you say, well, no, we're, we have to play these, you know, 
JL small etudes and and the kids go oh man really you know and and you have to make it come alive you said this is a dance you know and, and uh or, or, or whatever and um and maybe visit you know here check out some piazzola or something is this is a tango listen to that and uh, uh, try to you're in sales you need to make the th- make the thing come alive and you have to sell it to the audience and you ha- your challenge is to make it interesting to the audience even though it's not your favorite piece of music and and as professionals we we run into that all the time yeah and and again just to contextualize uh this has been a wonderful conversation but uh it's it's sort of all in relationship to asking that question how do you develop stylistic you know, more in stylistic depth. I in think your, you said in your it. Playing. Yeah. Listen so, broadly. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think what I'm learning from you, at least from what it sounds like your perspective is that it's not necessarily like if it can be a fun process, we should maybe just try to have the process of listening, just be a part of our daily, whatever we do. But every once in a while, <laughs> We might have to engage with some music that doesn't interest us, and it's still our responsibility to study whatever will help us learn that so that we can understand the musical material deeply so that we can sell, you know, we can make it make sense to the audience. Yeah, one thing I tell students is we have to be like actors, okay? And you put on a, you put on a mask or a costume or something, you, have, you become a different person uh, or have a, maybe a different persona to play Gershwin than you would to play Haydn. You know, and I, I said, you're going to play the Haydn and Schitter. Imagine you're wearing knee breeches and a powdered wig and all that <laughs> nonsense that they wore back then. And the conductor you know. is slamming a wooden pole on the... <laughs> yeah, and, it's, yeah, and you're reading by candlelight. Yeah, you know, but anything you could do to, you know, uh, you know to kind of capture that uh, can only enhance, make it more interesting and perhaps even enhance your, per, your performance and, and make it kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, all for me, all this is coming. It's still sort of related to that understanding point. Like we spent some time understanding the rhythm. We spent time understanding the intervals or the the intonation or things like that. And then but understanding the context of why all that matters is like another thing that I think especially younger players will have to do more of than maybe someone like you who has spent an entire career studying and listening and performing and being around other musicians who have sensitive tastes and things like that. And it's just, if you feel, I, so to sum up what I'm thinking, if you are someone who is practicing a piece of music and you feel like you're not sure what's going on or what you're trying to accomplish, it might be that stylistically and musically, you don't have a clear enough picture. So no matter how good you are at the trumpet, you don't necessarily know in what context to use the skills that you have. Yeah. Do you feel like that's accurate or do you have a yeah, different absolutely. take on that? Yeah. Okay. So if a young student has, a, what's the Bernard Fitzgerald ver- variations on a uh, theme of handle or something is mm-hmm. students do it all the time. It's very, yeah. very well known. <laughs> Apparently not well enough known to me, but anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. so the, if the student, you know, the teacher hands the student this piece, you know, we have an, a kind of an embarrassment of riches now with YouTube and Spotify and, and, and all this stuff at your fingertips. And so uh, if I'm, faced with this, I might say, well, maybe I'll listen to some other stuff by this handle guy and, and it'll give me, maybe I can't find an, an exact performance of that piece, but let me hear, listen, oh, you wrote this, uh, Royal Fireworks. What's that? Water music. Oh, they, yeah, yeah. and, and you can hear that, get that style. And, and, and this is, and it's of that era and it can give you, you know, and you can find common rhythms and common motifs and go, oh, I, this probably goes like this. And it can, Again, it can help, it can help inform you and help make the piece you know come alive stylistically. And like I said, it's almost like transporting yourself back in time, mm-hmm. you know. And the, another thing I, I really like about the way you're describing this is it it just sounds like an exploration. You're you're not like like the way I said it was I'm trying to figure out how to play in this style. For you, it's like here's this piece of music that has now shown me that there's something I don't know. And now I get to explore figuring out how to learn about that, which is, of it sounds like a very fun and creative way of thinking about becoming more mature as a musician. Yeah, I think so. Or even as a, as a student, you know, we, 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 we get so hung up on the, the nuts and bolts as, as we kind of start this rhythms and there's intervals, and, yeah, you know, and you're operating a machine and, you, and you're worried about all this, you know, operating uh these operating systems which uh, hopefully is gonna you know 
uh, there's, here's something I do with students sometimes, um, which is related to this. It's backwards. And I say, I'll say to them, uh, do you remember playing in, let's say it's a college student. Do you remember playing in, in um, high school pep band or junior high school? And you, you're, and you're playing those little, you still have those little Hal Leonard charts, you know, of, of the radio tunes. And it's a tune you've heard 10,000 times on the radio. And, and so it might be a piece, it might be Land of a Thousand Dances or 25 or 6 to 4. So I, th those are pieces from my childhood, but they still play. Yeah, you're stuff. taking me back. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and, you know, and that's, that song is so firmly in your mind, you couldn't miss a note if you wanted to. Yeah. You go, boom, because it's in there, you know, and it, that's sort of like reverse engineering. You have where you have a, uh, uh, you know, the style intimately. You know, uh, because you've you've heard it a lot, uh, and it, that's that's sort of backwards. And then you see it written on the page, and you go, "Oh, you know." And now, hopefully, the the page didn't, you know, you get this with arrangements. It doesn't differ too far from sure. you know what you've got. But um, uh, that's that's kind of a another way of of looking at it. Uh, yeah. But sometimes it's it's you know uh, the first time I played a piece like um, Vozek, which is uh, it's kind of like a late Mahler symphony put into a trash compactor and it's, it's just, it's horribly dense and compact and it's, and it's, it's transposing in F and it, the thing is just, you know, learning it as one nightmare after another. And then, you know, and it took me a very long time to actually enjoy playing it and realizing the genius of, of that composer. That was, that was kind of a tough slog, you know, a long yeah. haul. Uh, to learn a you know a, a masterwork but a lot of times or most of the time we there's models stylistic models and where we can you know uh get inspiration get stylistic uh um you know, guidance you yeah. know or or use them as a string board a springboard you know and even listening to different performances you know and i like what this guy does with this and i like what this guy does i'm gonna and we kind of form our own way of playing Whatever no, solo, post horn solo, or whatever. What was I? I was watching or listening to something yesterday. I can't remember exactly what I was watching, or I, it didn't have to do with music. I, I'm into uh, videography and film and stuff, so it may have been related to that. But people were talking about. I think it was like a copycat thing. Oh, okay. I know exactly what it was. They were talking about YouTube and how there's all these copycats on YouTube who someone will find a video style on YouTube that works really well. And then mm -hmm. you'll see people who start like plagiarizing, like scene for scene, word for word. They'll copy exactly what somebody else did. And sometimes mm -hmm. they'll experience more success than the other person. And right now on YouTube, it's like there's like this weird like whose is it and all that kind of stuff. And they interviewed this guy, Austin Cleon, who wrote a book called Steal Like an Artist. And he's talking about how it's a great book. And in this interview, he basically was like, you know, uh, what is it? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? And so he's arguing that like true creativity and making your own style comes from digesting so many different people's styles that exactly what you said, you begin to pull various things that you like. You copy this, this person's articulation or this person's sound concept or this person's way of doing this. And then over time, through copying these greats, you begin to meld into this is the style I've sort of settled into. And I think that to be a, a kind of an interesting way to think about it versus I have to ask myself right now, what do I want to do? Well, sometimes who cares? Like maybe you're not informed enough to have your own style and you should just go copy somebody else and see what you think about it. Yeah, I think so. So if, if you're, if you have to play a, a solo, you, and again, I, we have this, we have the, at our fingertips on our telephone, we, we can listen to a hundred different versions of many, many different pieces. And, um, and, uh, and I'll say, uh, you li listen to the way these different artists play this piece I've, to my students and, uh, and listen to who you want to emulate. And also, if there's a player you don't like, how come you don't like that? Why don't you like what they're doing? Mm. You know, and what is it, you know, about that? Um, uh, the jazz players are uh, especially uh, uh, talk about this, especially it's like, uh, I forget what the, the cliche is. First, you you know you emulate, imitate, imitate, emulate, and then create. 
you know, you, you learn note for note the solos of, of the great players and you, you absorb that language and that vocabulary and that style. But it's, it's not in order to ape them, but it's, it's in order to give you the tools to develop your own uh, uh, style. Sure. And I know they talk at length about that. Um, so I, I um, and to a lesser degree, I think we can do that with, with our playing in, in solo literature and stuff. Um, or when back in the day, if you listen, you listened to a, you heard an orchestra recording on the radio, you could tell who it was. You know, oh, that's Philadelphia. Cause that's Gilbert Johnson playing. Cause I, and you'd, and the guys had a individualistic, you know, uh, it was Catala, it's Vacchiano, it's Hersa, it's, you know, or the yeah. oboist or whatever. And now that's disappearing that, or it may have disappeared. And there, there, there are few players that are, uh, that have that individuality or maybe are allowed that individuality. And, and now you don't know who it is, but um, I, I think it's uh, uh, something that is uh, worth developing and encouraging. Uh, don't do it in an audition, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, auditions, you have to be what I call FM 100 middle of the road. You can't, you know, be so extreme or show too much personality or you'll, you'll offend somebody on the panel. Yeah, but, sure. um, but, uh, but where we have our, our solo opportunities, you know, I think it's uh, we want to cultivate, cultivate that. And it's, it'd be an individual. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is going to segue into the next thing I want to talk about, which is, I know you were talking about, you know, we talk so much about the nuts and bolts. This has been a wonderful conversation about style and music, but we should talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts because for some players, no matter how many times they've heard Alpine Symphony, if they can't play uh, a high D strong, you know, yeah. no, ma no matter how well they hear it, there's a physical limitation there or, or yeah. something like, you know, if you can't double tongue, no matter how many times you've listened to something like Scheherazade or whatever. So my next question for you in terms of process, like we've sort of almost covered this understanding step. The next step is you're actually now, let's say you understand it, but you're not yet able to put it together. Do you have a process for breaking down the piece when you actually start practicing it? Uh, do you, when you run into a problem, I mean, you're developed enough that something like double tonguing is probably just figuring it out versus I need to actually figure out how to double tongue, but just what's your process of so uh, encountering a problem and solving a problem? I know it's very theoretical and hopefully I can get more specific as you talk, but I just see what you come up with okay. with that. Well, I, I do a thing I call weighted practice, W E I G H T weighted practice. Uh, so I don't do exactly the same thing every day and I'll, I'll weight my practice towards the things that are required of the upcoming repertoire. So, but let's say it's Scheherazade, you know, I'm going to be doing a boatload of articulation, you know? And so instead of maybe long tones or scales, I go, and I'll take those things and I'll incorporate them into my, to my practice or, um, uh, let's say it's Alpine symphony or something that is a little taxing, you know, it hangs out more in the high register. I'll weight my practice in that direction. So, uh, uh, and I've been doing this pretty often uh, lately, doing more, I've been doing more commercial work uh, or playing. Um, and so I, uh, which involves more high playing. So I, I make my opening, my first note of the day uh, might not be a low C or a G. I'll, I'll frequently go, I don't have perfect pitch. So sometimes I'm in my studio now. Sometimes I'll I have a keyboard over here, and I'll just go. I'll play a an easily produced high note. I'm not going to kill myself, but I'll go. Okay, that's my note today. I'm starting there, and then I'll go find it on the piano, you know. And I'll say, and I'll I'll just that's going to be home base today, you know. And it, it gets me started a little bit higher. I've, and I'm going to function a little bit more in that upper registry instead of making it a, an, an extreme to which I uh, uh, travel and always return back to low C or, or you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'll, 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 tr I'll spend more time in that register. It's a little more taxing, so I'll rest more often. But um, uh, so I'll wait my practice towards, you know, what's, you know, what's needed 
or, sure. you know, what's required. I've almost lost your question, but anyway. <laughs> no, 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 I'll, I'll bring you back, I promise. Yeah. So that was actually okay. quite fascinating. Um, but to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, some of the, like that approach is very sort of like job specific, like the repertoire is dictating their general work because that's the thing you're doing most of the time. Right. Or maybe when, it's a perceived weakness of mine. Sure, sure. Maybe I say, you know. So for like a solo piece, let's say for someone, like a student in college who's got a jury and a solo piece and they're trying to learn this, you know, let's say they hypothetically, they sing through all the intervals and they've really listened and they know the piece. Like if I were to coach somebody, I would have broken this piece down in various sections, having them play the sections sort of in isolation, you know, maybe maybe 16, 24 bars, and then have them work with that section rather than playing the piece start to finish because I want them to be able to get back to the problems that they encountered and remember them. You know, there's a plan for recording. If you're talking in that context, do you have things that, well, you could say that you would recommend to someone if maybe you are mostly focused on the repertoire for work, but you're teaching somebody in a solo capacity. Do you have things that you recommend for how to break a piece down, how to go about finding and solving problems, stuff like that? Where does recording fit in all those types of things? Well, uh, recording yourself is a drag and nothing will improve your playing faster. You know, and recording used to be a, you know, when I was a student, that was a that was a uh, a big pain in the neck. And now all of us carry around a wonderful little recording device in our pocket, so it's pretty handy. Now, listening to the playback can be depressing, it almost <laughs> always is, but nothing will improve your playing faster. So you've got instant feedback. Um, uh, you, as far as making your piece easier, there's two things you can do to make to to uh, make practice easier: play softer and play slower. Both of those things will, will decrease tension. Anything we perceive as difficult, uh, playing fast, playing high, playing loud, uh, maybe, I, yeah, well, I said fast, speed will cause us to tense up. We always, you know, so uh, just even a slow piece uh, like the, you know, no, uh, no, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, no, I, I, I was, I was, um, I had an experience with the Telemann, the first movement of the Telemann concerto, and I, I started practicing it very softly, even slower yeah. than it's usually done, and it was actually easier to play. And you, it was like, that's weird. Mm. <laughs> you know? We usually we think of it as like this, ah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's kind of an endurance thing. Me. That but is I, like but, one of the only yeah. pieces still to this day. Like, I've developed skill on the trumpet. I feel very confident in many ways. I've had enough bad experiences with that that it's one of the few pieces that I still have, like, baggage with. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think someone told me once, um, I guess maybe I brought it from this. Uh, they said uh, uh, Leon Rapier, the great trumpet player, I think he was with Louisville uh, and did, did all that, you know, modern music. But he, he would play Baroque repertoire softly and slowly on his B flat trumpet, just, you know, you know, or, or, or whatever it is. And, and again, it was kind of like a, or excuse me, I don't mean to impose what I'm, the way I interpreted the interpreted it was I made a game. I'd like to make a game out of things. Yeah, I, yeah. I like to keep it light. I want, so I make a game out of, I'm going to play, um, uh, this piece on my on my B flat jump, and I'm just fooling around. I'm playing light, I'm playing soft, and I'm learning to negotiate that. In this case, high register, you know, and you can become you know kind of fearless about it. Uh, and it, it, part of it is is becoming acclimated, you know, to functioning in there. And then there's there's certainly physical, you know, uh, 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 there's a physical aspect to doing that, but playing it softer and not make um, um, and making it exploratory as opposed to, I must do this and I must have the high G at the end or, or whatever. And, and laying all these um, uh, uh, rules and expectations on yourself, but you can just kind of explore in that registry and you, you gain uh, facility you also gain muscle memory of what it feels like to function up there so for instance, you you mentioned something earlier about um a lot of teachers will say well you just have to hear the piece you know and then that's your model 
you know, okay, so you listen to great players now, now do it. And, um, a lot of people aren't wired that way. Uh, not only that, they, or they'll have a physical, something physically that they're doing in their approach that will never ever allow them to get there. And, um, I tell my students, every every trumpet player wants to play higher, louder, faster. Some of them even want to sound better, right? But they all hate it when stuff feels different. And but the and the rub is anything that is gonna sound different has to feel different. Right. Yeah. So you have to be ready for this kind of uncomfortable, oh, this is pretty crazy. And you know, and then trusting your ears or your teacher's ears or or whatever. Uh, and so um so a lot of times, and that was one of the breakthroughs for me was, oh, this thing can feel this way. Someone introduced me to a, a technique, totally different feel. It's like, oh, far out. And then it opened all these other doors, yeah. to different sounds and, and, and techniques. Maybe it's, it might be high notes, it might, it might be playing with, a, with a, 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 a rich sound in the upper register as opposed to a strident sound, which was one of my, you know, big millstones around my neck, you know, because of my <laughs> background, you know, sure. And I, I didn't know how to do it. And so I, I want to, you know, I, if I got into symphony and I'm playing all the right notes at the end of the symphony and the conductor's like, Oh no, I can't deal with that. You know? And I, it, it's, it's too bright. It's too blah, blah, blah. And so I bought a stupid mouthpieces and stupid equipment and, you know, to try to solve it that way. And that then was, it was technique based. Sure. I didn't know what to do you know, to make that sound. And when I did whole entirely different feel, Oh, far out, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, here you're, you're tapping into this other thing. I wanted to talk about yeah. the, sort of the pedagogy side of things, which I yeah, feel yeah. like I, I got to keep the lid on that particular thing because <laughs> I don't want to get too box. derailed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would love to talk to you about it. I think we got to save it um, for, for the time being, but, but, I, I think one thing you've said that I think is is um, valuable to consider is that sometimes the best thing we can get from repertoire is uh, an, an an uncovering of the things that we need to work on essentially. And right. so even if so, even if we work on something and we end up not being able to do it as well as we want to, seeing which things never really get better, no matter how much we work on it, is beginning beginning to uncover that's a fundamental issue i really need to find a better solution for at least that's my uh -huh. take on it i think it depends on the piece um because i've had i had a, a, a different experience i started playing 20 years ago or so um i started uh, tackling uh bach cello suites and and transcribing them and, and playing them and of course when you first start playing those they're, they're just impossible you know and I just kept kind of picking away at them and playing them. And through sheer repetition and, and uh, repeated practice, I not only learned them and was able to play them, but the more I played them, the more efficiently my body learned how to, this is completely unconscious, subconscious, but my body learned the most efficient way to play them so that I could actually play these incredibly long phrases without falling to pieces. And I, I realized after the fact, long after I'd memorized, you know, several of them, it's like my body has learned the most efficient way to play it without my even thinking about it. And, um, and it, it's a case of repertoire teaching you uh, sure. sort of subconsciously. And I think, I think we all have stories about that, about tackling a piece that we really loved or something. And, um, and uh, you become a better player just for trying, just for tackling the piece and staying after it because you love it so much. Tomasi was a piece like that for me. Um, mm -hmm. I heard that as a kid and checked a record out of the library. And it was the most wonderful piece. Of course, I could, I had no business playing that piece. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was, I loved it so much that I, I did, you know, it, it allowed me to transcend, I think, some of my limitations, which is a little bit different take on, on what you were speaking about but i think we all have those experiences as well yeah. as well well it's it's definitely an interesting perspective do you feel it would be fair for me to to say that part of the reason you were able to have that experience is because of the skill that you've developed that 
it was a matter of lear- your body learning how to coordinate everything, but you already sort of knew how to do it. It just needed that that time to coordinate it. Or do you really feel like you developed the skill in and of itself through the process of doing that? I think it's uh, I think it's some of both. It's a okay, it's a huge sure. jigsaw puzzle, and I, I think we don't you know uh, none of us uh, improves you know like that. Yeah, it's like, sure, sure. Eh, eh. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and you put these pieces together, you know, uh, uh, and I, I you know, I, I think all of us have that. And, uh, you know, you've I know you've had the experience of you're playing at something and you make some kind of breakthrough and you. Oh, that's what Professor Dinkle Fritz was talking about 20 <laughs> years ago. For now sure. I get it. Or, sure. or your sixth grade band director. and You go, oh, duh. You know, yeah. that happens to me all the time, you know, and. Or if I work with a student, I also, if they do something particularly well, I'll say, I'll stop them and I'll say, all right, what were you doing? What did it feel like? And sometimes they'll come up with something that is so creative and so interesting and so different. um, Then I go, I'm stealing that. You know, Mm -hmm. that's, I, that gives me another tool for, for teaching and for my personal practice. Yeah. You know, and, and so, and it's, it's just a huge I say jigsaw puzzle, but, you know, I think it's the way a lot of us uh, uh, solve problems. And and sometimes it's not a systematic thing. It it involves uh, uh, being very open-minded and very creative and and very, um, well, I don't know the words escaping me, but I think you get the idea. No, I do. And, you know. Again, as I said earlier, I I, I do understand what I'm I'm trying to do (laughs) is sort of an impossibility because there are so many sort of unquantifiable aspects about what we do. One of my beliefs or things I'm working with right now is that having a decent amount of structure about how you go about doing things and then understanding how to work in that creative sort of open-ended time within that structure, I think is really healthy so that you make sure I am going to get to everything that I need to do. I am going to cover all my bases, but I am allowing time to explore when I need to. And I I think a lot of people have one or the other. It's either I have this very open-ended practice, whatever. That's how my practice used to be. It was like, could I triple tongue today? Oh, okay, cool. Can I play like an F above the staff? Great. You know? (laughs) And then now I feel like I've been learning how to be more structured with it. But at a certain point in time, maybe it was like too structured and rigid. And now I'm trying to find some middle ground. That's kind of why I'm asking these questions right yeah so if you're you know and and, and, uh college students especially but even professionals you know the older we get the the more things we have that demand our time you know that's whether it's you know real life things or repertoire or whatever we have to structure our practice so that we can take care of business but how about structuring in some time for free form practice yeah yeah i'm gonna here's a half hour here's an hour and i'm just gonna do, I, I do things I call creative noodling, you know, where I'll just fart around on the trumpet. I'll have a, I'll have a, a kind of an idea what I'm do- It might be high playing. It might be patterns. It might be whatever, but I'm going to allow myself the freedom instead of just sitting down and uh, allowing myself uh, some idea to hijack my time. And, you know, two hours later, I haven't gotten any work done, but I've been, I've been just kind of having fun and and i haven't made no progress on the the piece that i have to play tomorrow night or you know or whatever it is you know and so but yeah. i think we could i think that's a great idea and you can you know, go ahead and uh you know uh, uh schedule your practice i'm, I'm gonna i gotta do my triple tonguing i gotta do my papa i gotta do this this i gotta do the eight papa, and then leave yourself some time for free form yeah practice you know and i think re- students get benefit from that a lot yeah, so um, I don't know how much you've seen about what I post online, but I, like I was saying, I'm very much into like the structure of things and sort of trying to map out uh, almost the equivalent of a workout program, right? You know, like you go into the gym and you have this program and it's like, these are the things that I do. And so I think it helps you stay very focused and goal oriented because you're not thinking about all the other fringe things as much. You're just like, I got to do this exercise and I'm going to try to do it the best I can. And I think for general skill development, it works not as well as like working up an audition list or learning a piece of music because that skill development kind of needs, like you're saying, that open-ended exploration. 
Um, so keeping it, I totally agree with you and I don't feel like, well, anyway, keeping it specific to like learning a piece of music. I think one other thing that can be difficult to manage, and I'm curious for your take, this would be especially related to technical music is managing the slow practice versus performance practice. And how long do you spend playing slow before you start speeding it up? Or do you try to do a little bit of both like in your practice when you are because obviously slow practice is great for learning. You obviously you said that earlier, but we do need time at the performance to acclimate ourselves to what that will feel like physically, mentally, breathing, all that. So I'm just curious if you have a take on how you manage that throughout a process over a period of time in terms of do you have ways that you think about that or is that pretty organic for you as well? No, it's not, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know where I... Very few, very few. I have very few ideas that are original, but I can't remember where a lot of them have come from. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but one of the things that I'll do, for instance, I'm, I've performed the um, Malcolm Arnold um, Fantasy for Trumpet, mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty challenging piece. And um, uh, there's a there's a very very fast section uh, in the middle. Uh, it has all these these kind of scales and that they're not really patterns but i was having some real problems with them lately it might be age i don't know and so and no matter how much it seemed no matter how much i practiced them slowly i could never get them up to speed um which made me just crazy um and again it could be an age related thing but uh so i i resorted to doing little bursts i would play a six note pattern very fast. So it goes, let's say that I go, because I could play those little bits quickly. And, and you're probably familiar with it. I think it's the Galman, uh, uh, the violin, the violin teacher, you know, who would, uh, Galami and yeah. Gami. Oh yeah. I can't, couldn't remember his name. Yeah, you know, how, where you right do, behind me here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Where you do little bits fast, you know, you gotta go. You go. And you practice. I call it practicing fast in a slow tempo. You know, but it was. It's a variation on that. So um, uh, I am always looking for instead of banging my head against the uh, cinder block wall as I would have, as I did in my teens. I look for a different way to think about it. Whether it's playing a high note or fast, I, I've got to play. I've got to play up to this high note. You mentioned Alpine Symphony. Oh my God, how am I going to play this? These high Ds. How am I going to get to that? Well, uh, a breakthrough for me was, oh, I can play into the high note instead of having to go up to it. Oh, that's a different mindset. I'm, there's no high notes; they're just fast vibrations. I'm going to go forward into the note, and that act, that allowed me to access some of those notes. And a different way of thinking about it caused all kinds of very subtle muscular things to happen. And so you know, creative thinking and, and, you know, can be really helpful. And, and, uh, and we can, we can get that from all kinds of different, different teachers, you know, and techniques. Why is this guy practice like that? And what's he get out of it? Oh, far out. Okay. You know, uh, and I'm always thinking about things like that. Um, there's an interesting book. You, you said something earlier and there's an interesting book I'd recommend to you and your, you may know it, uh, or your listeners, which is called the practicing mind. Mm-hmm. By a gentleman named Sterner, I think. I got it wrong once. It's not a big read, but it is. It's it's dense with ideas. It's and he, he talks about, and he's a, he was a successful he's a successful musician, but also has other skills, you know, sports and, and things like that. And he talks about getting good at these things, and it's a really eye opening uh, thing. And he focuses more on process than goals. You know, sure. Have, enjoy the process. You know, yeah, and, and you know, uh, and he, you know, but it, it's a fascinating read, and it kind of, it, it, it uh, maybe it was more in sync with the way I approach things. Yeah, uh, but uh, I thought it very, very interesting. Yeah. So this next question, I'm going to ask if if the answer is no, you can just say no. <laughs> All right. Like, okay, we don't have to go super deep into it because I understand how weird this question is going to be because I don't think people will think this way, but. When you say you think differently or you're looking or maybe in this particular way thinking differently was I going to play these short bursts, right? In my mind, when I hear that, it's like, well, that will specifically be related to 
a passage that's very technically challenging. I don't wouldn't use that all the time. I might use it in that way as a tried and true solution for something like that. Obviously, thinking differently about range could be specific to that. Uh, another a couple of you know, even singing would be this kind of thing or visualization, altering rhythms, things like that, slurring everything instead of, you know, slurring articulate passages to get the airflow. These are all various tips or tricks or ideas that I think are incredibly valuable. But one thing I think can be confusing is when to use them. And so I'm curious if you have not that you have to label them all out, but do you find yourself using like if you encounter X problem, do you find yourself using X solution that fixes that problem? Or is it sort of like you'll just pick something at random to fix it? Does this question make sense? Yes. So let's say you're playing Petrushka and you're trying to da 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 And you're like, okay, my articulation or the notes aren't connected. Like for me, one solution would be to slur the whole thing, right? And then right. to try to pretend that I'm slurring. Uh -huh. But maybe I would just immediately go to that solution every single time for a problem like that. So Ravel Piano Concerto or Tomasi Trumpet Concerto or technical parts of the Peskin. Do you find yourself practicing that way, that you have tried and true solutions for certain problems? Or do you still, it sounds like to me that much of your practicing is organic and you're trying different things. But I'm just curious if you find, now that I've found a solution for this problem, that will be the solution for this problem. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Yes and no. Um, uh, there are some things um, that I, uh, uh, there are some things for which I'll tell students, I have an app for that. You know, I, so let's say it's the high soft entrance, which will give a lot of trumpet players will have the night sweats about a concert where you have to pick off a, a certain high note, you know, in a, in a piano setting. But there are a couple of things. Um, one of the, if I can think of singing falsetto, projecting the sound this way, and maybe playing a little bit off the, my bottom lip. That's something I'll always do for the high soft entrance. Um, other things, it's more like a repertoire of um, a, a, a toolbox, and and which I access more, or I, I stay more closely in touch with because I, I do teaching. Uh, and the more teaching you do, uh, I, I think uh, if we can turn around and, and use that to solve our own problems. One of the best all-purpose um, uh, approaches for Technical problems, which sound, which is counterintuitive, is think of it as melodic. Can I think of this? Can I think of that as a melody? And it, it, it puts a whole different spin on the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and and lo and behold, a lot of times the finger issue will fall away, or the articulation, or, or whatever it is, just by thinking melodically. And I know Herseth talked about that, you know, a lot. Uh, it's and again, it's it's not some, and maybe the piece is very pointillistic and very you know acerbic and astringent and you know, you know some you know musically, but again, thinking melodically can be a a, a, a breakthrough. But um, yeah, uh, but I will be. Uh, I feel very free about if something doesn't work, I'll try something else. I'll yeah. try, uh, and I have. You know, but uh, so I don't have, I, I guess to answer your question, I don't have a one size fits all approach, but I will have two or three favorite things. Sure. That, that makes I'll, sense. That I'll yeah. do. And then, um, and then some things will, f there are also techniques that I don't necessarily subscribe to. Like I'm not a big wind and song guy, but if I have a student, you know, if my stuff doesn't work, I'll say, okay, let's try this thing. You know, I'm yeah. not saying my way is the only way. And if my stuff doesn't work, we're going to do something else, you know, yeah. yes, that's going to help elevate the student. That makes a lot of sense, actually. And I feel like I fall into that camp as well. There's like, you know, one or two things that if I experience a problem, I think it's it's usually related to either my air is not consistent or I'm not hearing it. Right. It's one of those two things. Right. And so, you know, usually slowing it down and slurring it fixes both of those problems. And so, like, for me, it's, like, almost a go-to. Like, I'm going to do that first, and if it fixes the problem, awesome. 
If not, yeah. I'll have to get a little bit more creative about how I go, which, like you said, it doesn't fix every problem. Um, I'm going to try to recap really quickly here. And then we'll see if there's anything that you can think of that's left. So you get a new piece of music. You're basically your first goal is to understand what's going on. And so you're not focused so much on playing things on the trumpet specifically, but you're trying to make sure that what you hear in your head is accurate rhythmically in terms of intervals, in terms of style. You're just making sure that that, that picture in your head is well informed. I'm assuming you would say that as you practice, it still becomes informed in more nuanced ways, but you're trying to get a big chunk of the picture taken care of before you really start working on the sort of getting things down on the trumpet. Cause you probably yeah. argue that that fixes a lot of the problems in and of itself. Of course. And then, so I also wrote down here that when you are, especially when it's related to ensemble things, tricky passages, you may work into your fundamental work uh, in terms of maybe you might double tongue some scales or you might, you know, you might play at different dynamics if you have extreme dynamics coming up. And that's just an overall technique you will use in order to get a little bit of extra practice on these difficult aspects of pieces. That's another thing I wrote down. And then in the actual practicing, you you talked about recording. This I have a question about this. Um, and maybe again, I, I know I'm trying to like pin down like specific answers to things where the answer is actually it depends. <laughs> but <laughs> is there a, a a way that you think about how you incorporate recording? Because for me, one thing that was uh, was daunting is how much am I supposed to record? Do I record my entire practice session and then go back and listen to it? That seems like so much time but like if i only record a little no. bit is that worth my time so yeah. i would love to know how you either think about incorporating or how you recommend to students to incorporate it no i'd be on suicide watch if i recorded my whole <laughs> yeah. practice go oh, that no just just every once in a while you know uh if it's, uh, if it's a especially if it's something you have coming up that you have to perform. I have this little solo I have to play. Let's hear, you know, let's hear what I'm foisting on the audience, right? Or the conductor. And, or, and you just, and you pick up these subconscious things. Oh, I didn't know I was doing that. And you fix all the stuff subconsciously. Uh, I find myself uh, coaching students all the time and they're playing a solo. Maybe, I don't know what it is. It's, maybe it's one of the John Williams things, the, the, the lyric thing, uh, uh, oh, what's the thing from uh, uh, Private Ryan or one of those things? Or some of the heroes is one of them. Yeah, yeah. And I start picking away at it, and yeah, I mean, and I, and I'm going, wait a minute, I should shut up. You know what? If you record yourself, you'll fix most of this stuff just because what's coming out the end of your horn is not what you have in your mind. Yeah, yeah. So I don't do a lot of recording, um, uh, and most of it's interpretive. It's it's like, uh, am I getting across to the audience what I what I want to? Whether it's a lyricism or a, some kind of an emotional uh, 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 effect, you know, whether whether it's excitement or you know the lyrical thing. Uh, so not too much, um, but no, I, I don't I don't record. You know, and it's uh, there's another thing too when you're recording yourself, and it has to do with like being nervous and playing in front of people. When you record yourself, you've probably noticed this. You're not alone anymore. Right. It's like, and your half your mind is on that. Oh shit! I'm gonna have to listen to that. <laughs> yeah. I have you students know, and, that are that's the same way. They say I'm completely fine. I turn on the recorder, and now I'm I'm so nervous. I would rather just not record. Exactly, but but it puts us kind of in our practice room. It puts us in that in that performance mode, right? Yeah. The, you, right. All of a sudden, you're in front of people, and it's like. Oh, I was great in the practice room, but now I'm really uptight. <laughs> and it can help you, you know, uh, uh, become comfortable with doing that. Or, or maybe, and usually it boils down to concentration, really paying attention to what you're doing, playing with great focus. And I think that's what what the great artists really have is that, you know, whether it's Herseth or Mel Broyles or any of these guys, they had this unbelievable power of concentration, uh, and which you know. There are many guys that are technically as accomplished, but that focus and concentration meant that their 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 performance level was very consistent and very very high. So that's that's it's that's a big help with yeah, with, sure. the, with the recording too. Yeah, I had a I'm going to share a quote that someone on my podcast said, and I would I'd be curious to see. It sounds like you would agree with it, but she was saying in an audition, you have what you sound like 
and what you want to sound like. And then you just use recording to get those two things to match over the course of time. Like recording gives you that feedback. This is what I sound like. And then I have a picture of what I want to sound like. And I'm just trying to figure out how to chip away to get those to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. So however we, much or however little different. you need to do that, maybe dependent on the on the person, maybe you would agree. Like if you need to if you have a lot of issues going on, maybe you need to record more than someone who just needs a little bit of feedback every now and then so that you can make sure you're just on the right track. Would you say that? I, I think you're right. And I think I think uh, even um, we players with decades and decades and decades of playing, we sort of take for granted that, you know, what we sound like. And sometimes recording ourselves can be like, Ooh, <laughs> yep. that's didn't know I was saying <laughs> yes, <laughs> we absolutely. can kind of police ourselves a little bit that right. way. Or, you know, uh, I had, a I had a very interesting, uh, uh, in, uh, experience. Um, I grew up in a drum and bugle corps. 1970s and 20 years later i went back and coached them in the summer times or you know i went back and coached them because all my friends that i grew up with were running the group and and uh and the the guys i was coaching they had rhythm problems and it wasn't great so i wrote these exercises out for them very patronizingly you know i'm the great professional one you play this and you'll be wonderful and then i went to record them for you know for i made a play along cassette tape right and that took me to school because that, that was humiliating. I because I could not record the things I to my satisfaction that I would want those guys to emulate. Sure, you know. And these were simple studies. Da 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 di, da 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 da. And it made me realize, oh, maybe maybe I need to be practicing this stuff every bit as much as they do. Yeah. And and it was very humbling. Yeah, and and so I, I think a lot of our practice, we, we, we uh, ignore the, that really ele- elemental, fundamental stuff from which all else springs. Yeah, I, I've had that exact experience. Not that exact in terms of that, but that, that yeah. feeling of I recorded myself playing very basic things for students and being like, this is not what I, I want them to sound better than this, you know? Um, yeah. So, all right. So that's wonderful. There was a little bit of nuance with recording. I'm glad we got to talk about. And then I think I actually didn't realize that I had already answered my question, but you had said softer and slower to remove tension is sort of a good go-to. So for anyone who's experiencing any issues when getting on the horn itself, um, maybe using those as sort of immediate filters to see like how much of how many things can improve just doing those two things. Yeah. And uh, then, go ahead. One thing I wanted to say uh, before is reading music is a skill that's completely separate from operating an instrument. Mm-hmm. And a lot of students don't realize that. You know, so actually, you know, a truly skilled musician can look at a piece of music, I don't claim to be one of these, and hear it in their mind and know exactly what it's supposed to be. And, you know, oh, and then you know, then you pick up your instrument, which has its own challenges. But you're halfway there if you know what you're doing. But if you're if you if you really don't know what the music is supposed to sound like, and you're trying to operate the instrument again, those are if you separate those things, sight sing the music. Everyone's least favorite class in college, sight mm-hmm. singing. Yeah, but it's probably the most valuable thing you can possibly do to, to elevate your skill playing you know music on your instrument yeah but so they they are different things a lot of times we uh, students approach them together and it makes their life much more difficult yeah and like i would i would say at this stage that we're talking about with softer and slower for me those are valuable from like a coordination aspect it's like Mm -hmm. you it's like the skills are there it's just learning how to coordinate it in this specific environment these notes these articulations these dynamics things like that so it's not so much that you can or can't do something but rather sometimes different combination combinations of notes just need a little bit of like like you're saying it's I may know how it goes in my head, but my fingers and my lips and my air all need to learn how to coordinate. And I find that to be an effective way, almost like I said, an immediate filter. I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to play it softer. And if it gets better, wonderful. We'll just work our way back up. If not, then it sounds like you're starting to think as much as you can outside the box. You talked about shorter bursts for those technical passages or really trying to think 
around various like maybe range issues you talked about thinking to the high note rather than up to the high note and that would maybe have an effect on the way you were producing sound and then having certain things that maybe always fix certain problems but generally being open to having a a lot of different tools in the toolbox so to speak um i feel like that's a pretty good that's a lot to work with i feel like for me and for uh, my listeners. So I appreciate you being patient with me while we uncovered kind of what we were talking about here. Is there anything, this is for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied uh, to be finished. I'm just curious if there's anything that you wanted to say, or you were hoping to say that maybe we didn't get to touch on at this point that you might want to share now. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I guess one thing that comes to mind, maybe it's not particularly apropos of what we were talking about, but there are a lot of instructional uh, video. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of instructional videos online, you know, that you can watch YouTube. And I know a lot of people will do deep dives into this stuff and um, maybe it's range or, or speed of tonguing and understand uh, just for anyone who does that, uh, take into account who's, who's talking and what idiom they work in. So, for instance, playing advice from Wayne Bergeron or someone who functions in that world has a different context than someone else, someone who's from the Canadian brass or, you know, who function. It, it just realize that these idioms uh, uh, oftentimes will dictate uh, 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 techniques and a lot of times what is what is allowable and 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 even idiomatically correct in the commercial idiom would not be allowed or is not correct in you know in the classical world and the, one of the examples in my book is um uh, uh, uh lee morgan's recording of i remember clifford not there's not one sound that he makes that would be acceptable in a classical <laughs> idiom. Not yeah. one, right? But it's beautiful. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful performance. But it lives in that idiom. And you, you know, but you couldn't, you couldn't make a sound like that in the post horn solo. You, you'd be run out of the hall. So, sure. you know, uh, so, it, you know, just be aware of the context, of, you know, of where these, where this advice is coming from. And a lot of, yeah, I, I'm, I'm all about, you know, crossover and, and doing what, what, what works, but uh, musically uh, uh, be, be aware that some th things will work and some things uh, will not work. Even though, um, even though uh, the advice comes from a player you greatly admire, they might be, you know, they might be talking about, you know, playing the high note in a big band as opposed to playing the high note, you know, in a Strauss uh, tone poem or something. Sure. It, yeah. it may or may not work. Yeah. I think it's a very good advice because, I mean, I am myself someone who who posts on my YouTube channel trying to share information about these types of things. And one of the things that I've really struggled to overcome is giving as much context as possible for why I think what I think so that you can connect with, is this for me or not? Because, yeah. yeah, I don't want to, I'm trying to avoid thinking that just because I think something and I play the way I play immediately makes it valuable with it just in and of itself, you know? And so really trying to provide context, I, I'm trying to think about it, and also making sure I think through how, I don't know, this is just me talking, I guess, but thinking through how I'm communicating the information as well so that it's well thought out information, not just like I just said the first thing that came to mind. Cause I also know people can take things and go in a whole different direction that I would have never intended. Right. Semantics are huge. The yeah. words you use, like um, uh, if you're if you're in front of the band, you're the band director and you want more sound out of the trumpets and the cornets, they might say, put some air through that horn. All right. That might not be the best thing to say, you right. know. Right. Uh, and, and first of all, first of all, 10 kids will do 10 different things. Yeah, exactly. But, what know, do you mean by that? Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, and so, but if you can say, you can say, I want a more colorful sound. Can you light up that trumpet? Can you give them uh, instructions that might and get the musical result you want rather than just giving them a, a physical instruction? And, uh, you know, and we hear that a lot from players, it's, you know, use more air or, you know, or I just, 
pick that or tongue. Uh, uh, there's an accent. You need to tongue that harder. That might not get what, right, you, right. what you want. So, you know, yeah, words are, are really important. And yeah. you, you, and that's one of the things I labored over in my book was how to get this point across so they could be at least misinterpreted the least. Sure. <laughs> you know? That's a good way to say it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, there's many ways to, you know, mm-hmm. what, what, what's the quote is it monk that said, uh, uh, using words to describe music is like using dance to describe architecture. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's almost I, impossible. Sure. Well, I mean, on that front, I, I don't think we should do it now, but, um, I think what I, what I want to do is read your book sometime soon, maybe over the summer, and then we'll get back together and we can discuss some of the ideas in there. Uh, I'd that be would interested travel. in your feedback. Yeah. It'd be yeah. an interesting yeah. discussion. I feel like, cause, um, from what I understand, there's a lot of ideas in there that I would really resonate with. So okay. yeah. I think I, I think we should do it that way. So for the time being, sure. I think this could be the end. Uh, again, I really appreciate you being willing to chat with me for this long. Um, sure. uh, if people want to find out about uh, you, your book, if they maybe want to get in touch with you and say how much they enjoyed hearing your lovely voice and seeing <laughs> your face, um, how would someone get in touch with you or find out more information about you? Uh, I'm on first book. Um, uh, got a copy of my book later in your summer. It's published by Carl Fisher, the singing trumpet. Um, I have some, I have, I didn't put things on, on YouTube, but I have some videos on Facebook. I have to put it on, uh, uh get it onto, uh, uh, YouTube. I'm digitally challenged. So it's, <laughs> I'm a bit of a Luddite, uh, in that way. Um, oh, we can help you out with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I know. Here we go. And I'll leave these links as, as long as I can sh- shamelessly plug, sure, plug my book. That's it. And it's published by Carl Fisher. Yeah, I'll leave the link in the descriptions yeah. and stuff so people can find it. And, I, yeah. and I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm open to, uh, feedback as well, both positive and negative, you know, like you send this thing, it sounds really weird to me. And maybe that will help me kind of fine tune my message. Cause you know, none of us want to be misunderstood. Of course. You know? And some of some of the stuff in my books is controversial and, so it's, and it's about maybe a different way of, I'm not saying, uh, Arnold Jacobs is wrong, but I'm focusing my attention in a little different direction, Yeah, yeah. you know? Uh, and, and so, yeah, I'm pretty excited to, to check that out again. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to, to reach out, like I said, the links will be in the description. Um, you can reach out to Peter. Um, I want to thank Brandon Yoakum for uh, mastering this episode. You can check out, uh, Brandon's work at epiphanyrecordingstudio.com. And uh, most of all, I would like to thank you for listening to this episode. Um, yeah, I guess we'll see you in the next one. Beautiful. All right. Stay out of jail. <laughs>